Order. Would honourable members please take their seats? Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The honourable leader of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice is to the Prime Minister. Bruce Chapman, the government's consultant on Ausstudy, has predicted that 400,000 Australians would have been out of work for more than one year by 1994 if unemployment remains at current levels for the next two years, which is what One Nation predicts. How will changing the flag help the 400,000 long-term unemployed? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Order, the Leader of the House. You've got a gall to ask about the unemployed when you want to, when you want to send them. No, you've really, you've really got a gall. Order. You've really got a gall. This Order. guy trotted Member off into Coronel. private life in 1983, leaving 11 per cent unemployment behind him, and now has, now has a policy of saying after nine months they can go fend for themselves down, down to a distress agency. That, that's, that's your policy. Order. But you don't even have the courage to own up to it. That's your policy, and you keep trying to avoid it on radio stations and television stations and everything else. You don't have the guts to, to own up to the fact that after nine months you want to turf people onto the street. And then you're up asking about unemployment. I mean, as if you crowd ever cared about the employed, as if you ever cared, as if you ever cared. And uh, Mr. Speaker, it refers to Ostadi and the, and the young unemployed. These were the people. You were quite happy to have three children in ten complete secondary school in 1983. That kids after primary school wandered out, in, wandered out without an adequate education in the labour market to then, to the, yeah, 11 per cent unemployment jobs, 11 per cent of unemployment. 11 per cent of unemployment, leaving Leader school at 15, leaving school at 15 without even putting them through. We turn, we turn those uh, participation rates up to from, from 3 and 10, 30 per cent to 70 odd per cent, moving to 80 per cent, add 50 per cent of places to universities, 50 per cent of places to universities, add the equivalent of 12 universities of an average campus size of 10,000 to the system. And, you, and you've got the hide to ask us about, about young people. You've never done anything for them. You never ever did do anything for them, other than simply regard them as, uh, as factory fodder or leave them, or leave them out of school hanging around the milk bars, hanging around the milk bars or, uh, or skateboard riding at some, uh, at some shopping centre. That's your idea of what uh, kids should do. And, uh, and now you've got uh, the, the temerity to be talking about the unemployed. What's it? Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me make this clear about the flag. I'll tell you this order. about the flag. Yes, the House I'll tell you this come about to this. That, eight, that, 80, that 80, nearly 80 per cent of Australian exports go to the Asia Pacific area. Nearly 80 per cent. 60 odd per cent of imports. 60 odd per cent of imports. The more this country is psychologically stripped down to trade, the more it is prepared, the more it wishes to trade, it, it invests for exports goes to these markets and actually goes there wanting to do business and integrate with those societies and those businesses, then and only then will the current account be entirely settled as an issue and that the growth we've come and employment growth and the growth in the economy we've seen from net exports in the last year or so uh, will come as a result of those sorts of policies. It is that sort of policy taking Australia out to the world that this government alone pioneered through the 1980s. I mean, you guys commissioned the Campbell Report and never had the courage to do any of it. You never had the courage to remove exchange controls. You never had the courage to float the exchange rate. You never had the courage to put tariffs down. You only put them up. You never had the courage to cut the public sector back. You never had the courage to radically alter the tax system. You never had the courage to do any of the things that declared Give us Australia a chance as a nation to trade out there in the world on its own freight, on its own fat, and not only that, holding its head high to be able to do it. You've got no concept of what Australia's capacities are in the region or in the world. You're quite happy to keep us a frightened little place, shut up by a tariff wall, manage exchange rates, manage exchange rates, exchange controls, sitting there as you always do, arguing for the status quo. That's all you're good for, arguing for the status quo. It's, it's always better later. It's always better later. Oh, yes, a republic, is that going to, oh, inevitably, probably, Order, yes, later. As long as it's later. Uh, you think the flag will change? Oh, probably, inevitably, but later. 
Do you think we ought to float the exchange rate? Oh, yes, but later. We ought to drop you. We ought to restructure your car. Oh, yes, but later. You know, everything's later. That's the thing about the Liberal Party. You've had to have been dragged to every progressive reform in this country by the Labor Party, by the only vehicle of social change, by us. You've had to be dragged screaming. And the only reason you had a free ride was our division of the 1950s, which kept the founder, your founder, which nearly saw us slip under the waves of the Japanese, the founder, in office for 16 years. We know all about you. We know all about order. you. You are basically unable. House will come you to are order. basically incapacitated. The and you've always Gilmore. been the same. Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Canning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask the Treasurer. Uh, order. The House will come to order. The Member for Canning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask the Treasurer a question of uh, economic importance to Australia. And I ask. I'd, and I promise not to mention the flag. Order. The House will come to order. I ask the Treasurer to advise the House of the economic significance of today's CPI figures for the March quarter. The Honourable Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, Canning for his uh, question. And of course, there's been a great deal of talk about zeros, particularly from the other side of the House. And perhaps it might have been an opportunity for the old Captain Zero over there to actually ask a question order. about... Uh, about, the the Treasurer refer to the this. Leader of the Opposition by his title. Yes, the Leader of the Opposition, otherwise known in some quarters as Captain Zero. As, uh, this, is, this is a... Order. A member this, for Coronel or cease in a check. This, this is a zero worth having. This is a big O. This is a zero worth having for Australia. And because it, what it, what it, what it uh, means is that it is just another indication of the uh, kind of uh, improving fundamental base which will underpin the forecast economic recovery as outlined by the Prime Minister in his uh, One Nation statement. The CPI figure also supports recent revised official forecasts of reduced inflation in 1991-92 and, most importantly, in 92-93. Mr Speaker, the March quarter CPI of 0% means that inflation over the past 12 months is just 1.7 per cent. A slight rise on the 12 months to uh, December because of the negative impact of the CPI figure in the March quarter 12 months ago. The underlying rate, which excludes volatile and seasonal factors, has declined from 3.4 per cent in the December quarter to around 3 per cent for the March quarter. And this sets another record low since this series was first constructed in 1971. The consolidation of low inflation and of, uh, in, and of um, expectations, lower inflation expectations, means that in inflationary expectations should now be 3 per cent or lower, and this is, uh, of course, a further indication of the fundamental uh, basis on which a recovery can, pursue, can proceed. As well as that, we have retail sales continuing to improve. Motor vehicle sales have shown steady improvement, uh, even if last month's strong growth is discounted somewhat for the effects of the cut in sales tax. And of course, the housing sector continues to improve as well. Order. There is far Mr. too Speaker, much noise. In relation to the official inflation estimates, there has now been a revision of the 91-92 figure, down from the two point. Uh, the two and a quarter per cent, which was included in One Nation, to now to two per cent for this year, and the inflation estimate for 92-93 has been revised down a full percentage point from three and a half per cent to two and a half per cent for that year. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, this uh, does provide a very important uh, measure of uh, what the government's policy flexibility is and does have an impact or a, a implication, I should say, for monetary policy. Of course, inflation isn't the only factor which informs our deliberations and those of the bank in relation to monetary policy. But this does, uh, of course, provide an opportunity for some relaxation of monetary policy, the extent of which to be determined during the course of consultations between the government and the Reserve Bank during the next uh, few days. But this will provide an opportunity to return to the, uh, the people of Australia a dividend 
for the improved position as far as uh, inflation is concerned. Mr. Speaker, it uh, is interesting to hear the Leader of the Opposition deciding to turn his attention towards uh, employment. Because, uh, of course, as each of these statistics comes out, as each of uh, these indications of progress and success come about, he is, uh, he, he is uh, reduced to a more and more constrained period of attack. But how could he possibly attack us on the question of uh, economic performance when we go back to the period which the Prime Minister referred to of uh, nine years ago? When, of course, the Leader of the Opposition was advising the then government in relation to economic policy. The only zero they could find then was a zero that had a one in front of it. A one in front of it in relation to inflation and a one in front of it in relation to unemployment. Just look at what uh, happened in the 12 months before our election in relation to inflation. In the period uh, going up to March 1983, we had March 82 inflation of 10.58. The next quarter, 12.32. 11.01, 11.54 in the, in the March quarter, the time when there was a change of government. And in that quarter, the quarter where there was 11.54, uh, we had unemployment just a touch under 10 per cent, and it rose to 10 per cent just after that. So these are people are the ones, of course, who were able to achieve that appalling result of double-digit inflation. Co coinciding with double-digit unemployment. And that's, that's the great difference now between now and then. We have inflation down to its lowest levels since 1971, providing the context in which we can see a return to growth and, of course, an improvement in the labour market. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is uh, to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, One Nation predicted that unemployment would stay around 10 per cent for some time into the future. How will changing the flag help to reduce this crippling rate of unemployment? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Order. Mr. Speaker yes, apparently the, uh, I understand, given the limited cerebral capacities of the Deputy Leader, that, that one subject at a time is about all he can comprehend. That if one actually brings another subject across, it's just, it's just simply a phase on the screen. He's phased out. That he can't comprehend a, social, a few social issues coming along with economic issues. That it all has to be you know, one track. If he's going to Burke, he's not going to Condoblin. There's just one, one, there's just one place for him. They've programmed him around in the office there. He used to talk about unemployment. Or chuh, 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 chuh. Unemployment it is. That's all there is. You know, he can't, uh, no other issues will, uh, is, going to, uh, is going to distract him. The fact is, uh, Mr Speaker, the thing about the coalition, they have basically, when it comes down to it, no real confidence in Australia. No real confidence. They've never, be never believed, never understood what Australians are capable order. of. Never understood the what house Australians will come are capable to order. of. Never wanted to give us an identity of our own. Always wanted to see us as de a derivative culture of somewhere else, forelock tugging to somebody else. I and mean, anyone said, "Look, let's get out there and get at them." Order. Let's get out there and get and, and get out them. The house will let's come get to out order. There and, and get at them. What's uh, what have we found from it? No, they've hung back in social policy, economic policy, right across the board. We lost them in the torpor of the 23 years you're in office. We lost the opportunities of a generation. And to find now that we've actually successfully crossed the Rubicon in Australia, where we're now looking at the rest of the world as a major market. For the first time, we're looking at the rest of the world as a major market, Order. as a major market, Order. and looking at the Asia Pacific in particular Order. as the principal Member market, for Bass. As, as the principal market, and it helps you when you go to that market to say we go as Australians. We don't go as surrogates for somebody else. We go as ourselves. That's why it's going to matter in terms of investment in Australia. That's why it's going to matter in terms of investment by Australians in those countries. That's why it's going to matter in trade, like with Indonesia, which has grown 50 per cent in the last two years, to $2 billion of trade and $1 billion of investment. It's going to matter in terms of job opportunities for Australians. It's going to, it's going to matter 
It's going to matter in terms of, uh, of employment. It's going to matter in many other respects. And that's why the business community Order. see the opportunities around the region. The only people that can't see it is the Liberal Party. The only people outside Order. of the, the major of the companies and the other people who have got some uh, life to them in corporate Australia, the only people who can't see the advantages is the Liberal Party, who uh, believe that we ought to basically stay at home, stay at home, stay at home and try and maintain living standards and employment from a small domestic base. But if we go to the world, well then hop on the plane and go somewhere other than where, where you're actually going to produce some real, some real investment and some real employment. The honourable member for Corbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the honourable the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister tell the House whether there are economic indicators which suggest a recovery is underway in the Australian economy? And if so, Order. do they indicate such a recovery will be sustainable? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Speaker, the one thing the opposition doesn't want to hear about is the recovery. The doomsayers over there want to hear nothing good coming for Australia. All the bad news, the member for all the bad news is greeted with applause, and all the good news is greeted glumly. Mr. Speaker, now the fact is that the fact is that recently we've seen, Mr. Speaker, motor vehicle registrations up nine and a half percent in March, to be 19 percent above levels a year earlier. To be 19 percent above levels a year earlier. Retail trade picking up also in recent months, with trend growth in the year to February was at 4.2 per cent, noticeably above the inflation rate. Similarly, housing finance approvals rose in February to be 26 per cent above levels a year earlier. Order. And buildings approvals are 18 per cent up on over a year ago. 18 per cent up on over a year. Building approvals are, are, they're not refinancing. Building approvals are 18 per cent over a year earlier. Various inputs into production, such as iron and steel and electricity and gas, are also strengthening, Mr. Speaker. But of course, the labour market remains weak, as it will, as it's always a lagged indicator of activity, Member for Bruce which will, will cease proceed. Injecting. And that's, of course, before many of the major initiatives in the One Nation package are having their impact upon the economy, which will be a beneficial impact. But today, Mr. Speaker, as the Treasurer has said, we've seen a remarkable gain on inflation. We've seen the consolidation of low inflation by a Labor government for the first time in two decades. We've seen, we've seen this government do what the Conservatives were not able to do, that's break the back of double-digit inflation. They came, these people who say they were the party of business, the people able to manage the rest of us, when the oil shocks came along and inflation and wage growth came along, they were unable to do anything about it. And as the Treasurer said, left office with unemployment at levels similar to today, but with inflation at 11.4 per cent instead of, as we have it, at 1.7 per cent. 1.7 in similar circumstances to 11.4. And despite that huge national achievement, with an underlying rate of 0.4 per cent for the quarter and 3 per cent for the year, the lowest numbers since the statistics have been recorded, and that's since 1971, uh, those low numbers have been preserved through the accord which the government established uh, and uh, by, by the operation of monetary policy. Now, Mr Speaker, by contrast, the Leader of the Opposition wants to wreck that result. He wants to introduce a consumption tax which will add five to six percentage points to the price system. Not content with the lowest inflation rate in two decades and with it the lowest interest rates we've seen, we've seen, we've seen since. He now wants to take something which has taken us two decades to achieve by reductions in real wages, by changes in productivity, by a total change in the way in which the economy operates. He wants to sabotage the inflation rate by an addition of an ideologically manic dri manically driven proposal to tax the food and clothing of Australians, their services, to drive the inflation rate back towards double digits. And that's the contribution he intends to make. But, Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition ought to be measured by his words in the recent past. In, in February 1990, he said, double-digit inflation. If you can't control and reduce inflation, you can't and shouldn't govern Australia. 
the corollary being if you can control and reduce inflation, you should govern Australia. Right? He's got his head down. He didn't, he's, he's ignoring that one. You see? He's instead he's ignoring that one. Poor little fellow. He can't Order. Get an answer. Mr. Speaker, for the sixth Order. time in seven years, the Treasurer, Order. he said that was then me, has failed to deliver an, an effective anti inflation strategy, all the way down to 1.7 per cent, as the Treasurer says today, to zero. But I failed to deliver an anti inflation strategy. Third paragraph. The Treasurer has obviously given up on inflation control. Accord Mark 6 announced today it will lead to higher inflation and higher interest rates. It will increase the likelihood of a major collapse in the Australian dollar. The likely economic consequences—7 to 8 per cent inflation. At the very least, it will yield more of the same—7 to 8 per cent inflation. Home mortgage rates stuck at 16 to 18 per cent. Business loans are 21 plus. <laughs> However, the high risks are double-digit inflation, the risk of a major exchange rate crisis, a consequential rise in interest rates. He was doing the same thing then, in February 1990, just two years ago, this person who claims economic credentials, this highly educated, this, elite, this elitistly educated, highly educated order. person. The House will come to order. The, the professor, professor forecast double-digit inflation. He forecast, uh, he forecast um, 16 to 18 per cent, business loans of 21 per cent plus, a major risk to the exchange rate. In fact, he's been wrong on all counts. Wrong on all counts. That was the response that he put out to Accord Mark 6. And I simply say to the public, to the House and to journalists, that nearly everything this person produces by way of what he claims to be a view of the future in relation to the economy is fallacious and inspired by his own gloomy view, which wants to visit onto this economy more hurt and contumely than the place ought to tolerate or ought to stand. And the same, not to be outdone, still at it in November 1991. He talked in the same terms. And then in this year, February, the 27th of February, he said, I reckon we'll have a major exchange rate crisis if this policy is going to run. Well, we knew what you reckoned, but you're wrong again. You're wrong again. And you've always been wrong. You're wrong with your policies in the, 80, the 70s and the early 80s. You're wrong with your forecast. You're wrong with your policy settings now, your proposals. It'd be, it, would be, it would be a sin. It would be a sin to sabotage the national inflation rate. It would be a Order. sin to the put, for it would be a ejecting. sin to put this major inflation gain asunder. All in the interest of a manic, of a manic determination the member for to, Young. to impose a new tax on Australians, to impose a new tax on Australians, to transfer wealth from the low paid to the high paid, in satisfaction of the miserable and narrow objectives you have always pursued as a party. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, today zero inflation for the quarter and 1.7 of the year is a policy triumph. A policy triumph and a great benefit, a great benefit for the people of Australia to give them lower, a permanently Order. lower inflation rate, low structural inflation, lower interest rates, and with it the health, the prospects of a sustainable, the Minister of a, for Immigration, of a sustainable economic growth into the 1990s with low inflation. Order. The honourable member for Benelong. Uh, Mr uh, Speaker, my question without notice is addressed to the Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations. And I ask the Minister, is it a fact that senior members of the government bargained for a public office with senior ACTU official Ms Jenny Acton? Did Ms Acton voluntarily step aside from a guaranteed position as the Labor candidate for Hotham at the 1990 election in favour of the present Minister for Energy? on the understanding that she would be provided with a position on the Industrial Relations Commission at a future suitable time. Did this deal have anything to do with Commissioner Turbot's recently strongly worded resignation, rubbishing the Prime Minister and your colleague, the Minister for Industrial Relations, where he inter alia deplored the stacking of the Commission with ACTU nominees? Yeah. The Leader of the House will cease interjecting. <laughs> The House will come to order. The member for Fowler will cease interjecting. The Honourable Minister. 
Oh, Mr. Speaker, Remember it certainly is uh, ironic to have Liberals talking about stacking, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, in the context of what's happening in New South Wales. But let me say, in relation to the, the question that's been asked, that uh, I know of no such uh, agreement. Uh, Ms Acton, I must say, at one stage was on my staff and uh, was a very good uh, staff, uh, staff for me. Uh, but uh, she has been, uh, for quite some time, uh, back with the ACTU and uh, would uh, doubtless uh, perform well whatever area of industrial relations system that she was uh, operating in. But uh, the uh, Commission, of course, has been uh, changed over the years. There has been an increase in the number of union-oriented uh, people who are members of it. Because, be, because, 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 under the previous government, Order. Under the previous government, there were virtually no people Member appointed from the union side of the, of the uh, industrial relations system. Virtually none. Virtually none. There was the order. Odd, the house was, will come to order. There was, Mr. Order. Speaker. There was, Mr. Speaker, the odd uh, one or two token appointments. But the, the the odd one or two token appointments and 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 some reasonable people were appointed in those very few positions that were, were made available to the union side. But amongst the presidential members, there were virtually none. In fact, off the cuff, I can't think of any who were there at that time who came from the union side, uh, or, even, or even who were lawyers uh, who had uh, been um, uh, operating at the bar but appearing for unions, apart from those who may, may have been appointed at the time of the Whitlam government. So, Mr. Speaker, what had happened over many, many years is that the Commission had essentially represented at the presidential level, lawyers who had operated uh, overwhelmingly for the employer side of the system. And there was very little representation at that level of people who appeared for the union side. Now, what has happened under this government is that there has been a balancing up. There has been, a, has been appointments made uh, to the Commission at the presidential level, which have uh, meant we'll that the there is now a, a balance in relation to, or reasonable balance in relation to, the presidential membership. As to those who, rep who came from the employer side or represented it, uh, being members of the bar, and uh, those who come from the union side. At the commissioner level, uh, similarly, there has been a balancing up, and that is as it should be. That is as it should be. We have made no apologies for that, because it is appropriate that this, uh, the commission reflects in its makeup the uh, nature of the, the parties who are appearing before it. It's absolutely wrong to do, as the, as the uh, Liberal governments did for decades, is to stack the Commission with people who represented one side of the system only, and particularly at the presidential level, but even at the commissioner level. And it's absolutely uh, right for us to have corrected that imbalance and to have made the Commission a much more balanced uh, body in relation to the parties who appear before it than it ever was in the previous days of uh, Liberal, government, Liberal National Party government. Order. If the member for Bass interjects again, I'll name him. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Kennedy. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question uh, is directed to the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. Will he advise the House of the importance the government attaches to regional economic development, particularly as it relates to the cane growing areas of rural Australia? The Honourable Minister. I thank the Honourable Member for his uh, question, Mr Speaker. And the uh, government does uh, consider the question of regional economic development as crucial to the economic development generally in this country. What we are aiming to look for is greater economic diversity in regional economic centres providing for sustained levels of uh, growth in those centres and obviously increased uh, job opportunities. What it really means, Mr Speaker, and it's been a theme that I've been pushing from this portfolio for some time, is not that we become less reliant on our commodity base, but that we do more with it. And that's particularly the case in relation to the sugar industry, where reports that have been um, referred to over recent days demonstrate that there is enormous potential for value-adding the uh, sugar industry, but it's not going to happen on its own. And that's why, quite apart from the broader economic settings that this government has uh, developed, there are specific programs that can assist industry, such as the, uh, the sugar industry, but are not limited to it. The marketing skills program, the innovative agricultural marketing program, for which the sugar industry, I might add, has been a recent beneficiary, local government development initiatives that are uh, developed through the uh, office of my colleague. Minister for Local Government, Rebus, the uh, regional um, 
Industry Business Extension Service, which was giving to the rural sector what the urban sector had in Nias, and together with that scheme introduced in the last budget, uh, under um, uh, my submission, Mr Speaker, there was also a Business Advisors for Rural Australia scheme introduced. I might add, Mr Speaker, that these very programs are the types of programs that fight back would abolish in the desperate desire to cut back in terms of its uh, government expenditure proposals. But what they do highlight is that our position when it comes to regional economic development does recognise the need for consultation and working with industry, identifying the impediments to those industries, using programs such as the ones that I've mentioned to facilitate genuine development. In other words, what it does is to recognise that there is a legitimate role for government, a proactive role for government, in working with industry to get these uh, initiatives going. But let's contrast where the coalition stands when it comes to regional economic development. Because where do they stand in relation to the sugar industry? We had the opportunity to address this in part yesterday. They've not asked a question on it, I might add, despite the furor that it's caused within their own ranks. But they are locked in to a zero tariff posi uh, position, a zero tariff position which will be determined by the Industries Commission report. We already know what the draft report is. We have got to await the outcome of the final report. As the events of the last week have demonstrated, the leadership of the National Party will do and say anything to shore up the Liberals' position and get behind the fight-back document. Yesterday we saw the member for Dawson resign his position, and uh, he's now been replaced by the member for Maranoa. Now, whilst I repeat publicly what I've said to him privately, that I congratulate him on his appointment, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what really has changed? Because we have, in the place of the member for Dawson, a national member of the National Party and a Queenslander. doesn't have a sugar seat. But what did he have to say earlier this week in relation to the sugar tariff question? If I can quote from The Australian on 21 April, an article by Tim Stevens and uh, Kevin Mead, Mr Bruce Scott said he did not support a drop in the sugar tariff on July 1. And in the Financial Order. Review of the same date, an article uh, by Robert Garron, Queensland MHRs Mr Bruce Scott and Warren Truss said yesterday that they would support moves to suspend the tariff cuts. So I simply say, Mr Speaker, that what we've got in this place, what we've got in this place is the same horse but a different jockey. And the question that we've got to ask ourselves really is what has changed on your side of politics? What has changed on your side of politics that enables you to hold that seat on the front bench, given the resignation by the member for Braithwaite? Now, the final point that I would go to, Mr. Speaker, is the question of the Order. leader of the National Party. The leader of the National Party, and emphasising this point that they will do and say anything to shore up their coalition partners. He was interviewed by Laurie Oakes last weekend, and this is what he said in, in response to a question from Laurie Oakes. Ours will deliver massive cost benefits, cost reductions through ab uh, abolishing payroll tax, sales tax, fuel excise tax to industry, including the sugar industry. Laurie Oakes said, Laurie Oakes said, but I mean, sugar farmers don't pay payroll tax. They use diesel in their tractors, not petrol, and they get a rebate on their wholesale sales tax. So there's not much in it for them, is there? Tim Fisher, Tim Fisher said, I'm Order. pleased to see you've done your homework. Treasury, your Order. own document has said that fight back Order. will save $288 million of sales tax, $679 million of fuel tax, and over $150 million. The Deputy Leader of the National Party will contain himself for a moment. The House will just remind you of what just Treasury like, itself said. If the Deputy the Leader of the National Party continues to interject, I'll deal with him. I know they're the sensitive, Mr Minister. Speaker. They deserve to be, because they're caught out every time the analysis continues. What he also, uh, what he also says in relation to this great gain, in relation to this own great gain, they hide the fact that every percentage increase point in inflation will add $1,200 cost increase to each farmer. 
1 per cent, $1,200. Now, you go trumpeting around this great savings that this, this um, package of yours will produce, apart from the fact that very little of it applies to uh, these farmers, you've got a position in which we have just been able to indicate today that our policies have produced inflation of 1.7 per cent annual. Your figures are going to inflate it back up to the double digit. That's a great proposition for farmers that are looking for cost reductions. So where's your strategy in terms of the cane growers and regional economic development? Zero, in, zero tariffs, no support for the industry without any consultation with them. Increased inflation, therefore increased uh, taxes, um, costs, negligible tax benefits and a consumption tax to boot. Well, I simply conclude, Mr Speaker, and advise the uh, new member to the uh, front bench on the other side that I am very interested about what coalition really stands for when we've seen the division over the last uh, couple of weeks. I looked up the dictionary. Coalition says a temporary combination of parties that retain distinctive principles. Well, Mr Speaker, that says it all. You've got the old protectionists over there. You've got a bunch of ideologically driven free traders in the Liberal Party, which the leadership of the National Party blindly follow. That combination is very temporary. The lemmings are lining up behind the member for Dawson at the cliff face. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, what disciplinary action are you going to take against the Minister for Transport and Communications for not disclosing his company directorship in radio station 2HD in the parliamentary register of ministers' interests? Has the Prime Minister discussed this breach of propriety with Senator Richardson? Why has the Prime Minister not stood Senator Richardson down for this impropriety? Yeah. 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 A, number, Prime a number of minister, me members, including ministers, have inadvertently left, uh, oh. left information off uh, things. The register, the registrar, wrote oh, to them. No. the registrar has, has periodically written to them, and they have uh, corrected it. Senator Richardson wrote to me today, uh, saying that he apologised for failing to note uh, his, di his directorship of two uh, HD on his pecuniary interest forms, um, and. Uh, he went on to say that um, uh, I want to emphasise that the omission on my part was not made by any attempt to conceal knowledge from yourself or the parliament. My directorship was well known by cabinet colleagues. The party generally it was a matter of public record. Uh, I am not aware of any instance when a conflict of interest may have arisen. Now I, I accept both the apology and the assurance. The honourable member for Mr. Perth. Speaker, the Mr. Speaker, I, I ask the prime the minister. Yes, I'd ask the Prime Minister to table the document from which he was reading. Was the Prime Minister quoting from a document? Quite happy is the document to, uh, confidential? Uh, well, it is to me, but I'm quite happy to uh, table it. The Prime Minister has tabled the document. The Honourable Member for Perth. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is directed to the Prime Minister. And I ask the Prime Minister, does the government intend to introduce legislation encouraging the making of enterprise agreements? and should employees lose award entitlements if they do not enter into order, enterprise order. agreements? The honourable member for O'Connor and Yes, a point of order. Uh, surely, and, and a, a question to a minister asking does the government intend to introduce legislation is requesting an announcement of policy, and the question is then out of order. Uh, there, there is a distinction between asking about policy and about introductions of legislation. There have been many questions in the past asking ministers about introducing legislation. The Honourable Minister, the Prime Minister. As we outline in our One Nation statement, the government will introduce legislation to facilitate the making of enterprise agreements. I, be I believe that through changes to the workplace, uh, and particularly through agreements, which are in, which arrangements which will be encouraged by such agreements, we can enhance productivity growth and, of course, improve the pleasure of work. But I, I want to emphasise very strongly, Mr Speaker, that it is not the policy of this government to force employees off awards and into agreements, which is now the real agenda of the opposition. The member for Bennelong likes to assure people they'll have a choice under the policies of the coalition of, of remaining under awards or entering into so-called voluntary agreements. But the leader of the, of the opposition let the real truth slip in Perth in January and in New Zealand recently. 
In Perth, he said, if I could have my way, almost immediately no more wage increases unless they are negotiated at a workplace by workplace level all around Australia. No more centralised wage determination. That is the fundamental of the process of change. You can do it. And uh, then in uh, New Zealand, he made it clear. It said, the federal, federal coalition is flirting with a plan for swiftly deregulating the labour market by scrapping the awards that provide the real underpinnings of Australia's wage and industrial relations system. He, and he went on to say, when the piece went on to say that the opposition, Dr Houston, alluded to a radical change in the coalition's policy and a sharp differentiation from the government's approach to labour reform during his tour of New Zealand. And, uh, but every time the Leader of the Opposition steps out of line, the, de the member for Benelong jumps in with uh, a fix, and the one he says applies this time is that our policy is to give people the choice to allow people to go outside the centralised wage system if they wish, if they want to remain within the ward system, that's okay, while at the same time saying he'll abolish centralised wage fixation. The fact is, Mr Speaker, under this policy, under this policy, 80 per cent of Australian employees who walk under, work under awards would find they've lost their entitlements. Entitlements to rates of pay, penalty awards, annual leave, working hours, all the things which have been built up over generations under awards would be just wiped away by, by such an approach. And we found the Australian Chamber of Commerce coming out supporting this proposal. A statement by Mr Brent Davis said, reported plans by the federal opposition to scrap federal awards are worthy of further debate and should not be dismissed out of hand. While this radical idea has been much discussed within employer circles and derives from reforms achieved in New Zealand, it's the first time it's been promoted by a senior politician, political leader in this country. And he goes, Dr Hewson's big bang approach would certainly destroy one of the major impediments, the necessary quantum shift towards bona fide enterprise bargaining outside the centralised tribunal. Well, Big Bang is right, Mr Speaker. Big Bang is right. So here we have, this is the policy setting, a, in the unlikely consequence of a Hewson government being elected. First of all, the addition of six, five to seven percentage points to the price system to inflation. Overnight, the inflation rate rises towards double digits. Overnight, the interest rate, the floor under interest rates, inflation rises, interest rates rise with them. Very quickly there later, the big well, bang in industrial the relations. The member for O'Connor on a point of Mr. order. Mr Speaker, you just ruled that it was proper for the Prime Minister to announce new government legislation, which was the purpose of the question. Surely, consequently, sec uh, Standing Order 145 applies. Somehow or other, that legislation, or the question as to whether such legislation would be introduced, has got us to a speech on inflation and effects of other tax measures. Can the Prime Minister either complete his answer as to what his government intends to do or sit down? Order. The, the Honourable Member for O'Connor resume his seat. The Prime Minister was asked a question about enterprise agreements and about whether people should be— Order. Order. He was asked a question. Order. Order. Members on my left will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister was asked a question about enterprise agreements and legislation about that and whether people would be taken off awards in that area. The Prime Minister is answering the question. He, he has digressed and he might come back to the answer. Mr. Speaker, the question. Mr Speaker, such a big bang approach would see the greatest confrontation between Labor and business in this country that we've ever seen. And instead of having, instead of having an approach where there is a national effort to keep inflation down, of a focus on Remember productivity to lift through enterprise agreements to lift productivity, low inflation and higher productivity. Instead of that, simply confrontation, division, argument, <coughs> nastiness, viciousness at the workplace would be all part and parcel of the agenda of this ideologically motivated party opposite. And while all that was happening, we would see a consumption tax introduced which would raise just on $30 billion where now the total uh, taxation revenue of the Commonwealth is of the order of 70 billion. It's all, almost a 50 per cent, almost a 50 per cent equivalent of the current revenue of the, of the Commonwealth levied on every, every Australian's necessities of life, food, clothing, services, etc. That's the sort of big bang that Mr Davis refers to in his article, and the big bang that would put Australia so far back in terms of the cohesiveness of this society, in terms of getting along in terms of going after the main chance, which is jobs, 
growth, product, exports. Instead of all that, we'd go back to the fruitless confrontation we saw in the late 1970s when the Leader of the Opposition was advising the then government. That's what his statements in New Zealand mean, and all Australian workers who, who feel comforted by the protections they have under award classifications for such things as rates of pay, annual leave, penalty rates and the rest would find it all swept away. That is, nearly, nearly a century of industrial effort swept away in an ideological binge which would put the nation further behind than we could possibly imagine in a, in a clash in a clash of interests, the likes of which we would never have seen uh, in recent times. The Honourable Member for Bass. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister and relates to the matter of the Minister for Transport and Communications. And I ask the Prime Minister, you would be aware that Senator Richardson was a director of 2HD from the 20th of the 9th, 90 until today, according to records of the ASC. I ask you, did Senator Richardson participate in the 1991 Cabinet decision to reduce licence fees by $8 million to the radio industry? What was the benefit to the radio station 2HD? Did Senator Richardson reveal his pecuniary interest in the matter during the Cabinet meetings? And would he agree that the last, last sentence of the letter that you have just tabled, where Senator Richardson says, I am not aware of any circumstances when a conflict of interest may have arisen, is in fact false? And I ask you, do you still hold to the view that no disciplinary action is required? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The I'm just not aware of, uh, of, the, of the dates. He was appointed on 21 September 1990 uh, to the post. Uh, he, was appointed, he was appointed minister on the 14th of uh, January. On the 20th of January, he signed and dispatched letters to the New South Wales Labor Party resigning his directorship. In other words, he had, uh, yes, it's owned by the Labor Party. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, Order. And uh, that is for a period of six days, Mr. Speaker. From the 14th of January 1992 to the 20th of January, he remained, uh, he was Minister for Transport and Communications. Uh, uh, Order. He was, a he was a cabinet minister during the period. But uh, again, his, uh, his, directorship, his directorship of uh, 2HD and his uh, stewardship of that station has, been, uh, has extended over a period of now nearly two decades and is known practically to everyone in public affairs. The Honourable Member for Burke. Point of order. Prime Minister, I think you've missed the point. Order. The question is, he was a member order. of the Cabinet. Order. He was a there, member there of the no Cabinet without revealing no his pecuniary interest. Do you believe there's a, a matter of discipline? His seat. The Prime Minister has answered the question. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Burke. Order! The House will come to order. I warn the Member for Kuyong. The Member for Burke, and I might say to Honourable Members on both sides that the next step after a warning is to be named. The Honourable Member for Burke. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. I Mr. warn Speaker. the Member for Coronella as well. Mr Speaker, my question without notice is to the Minister for Employment, Education and Training in his capacity representing the Minister for Transport and Communications. I ask the Minister, can he advise the House of the progress that the government has made in bringing about microeconomic reform in road, rail and on the waterfront? And I also ask him, I also ask him what prospects are there for uh, bringing about an effective interface between land and sea transport for the first time in this country? The Honourable Minister. I uh, am delighted to get the question from the Honourable Gentleman, who I know from uh, experience in, in the portfolio when I held it, uh, that uh, there was a, uh, he, he was a, a very active man in this area and I understand he's recently been taking some councils and other people interested in regional development in his electorate around the airport, the freeway, road yards and, uh, and the waterfront, showing them the changes that have, uh, have been taking place. The question is particularly relevant. Uh, given the comments being made by the Leader of the Opposition on what it is required of Australian statesmen as they visit uh, our neighbours and people further afield. Evidently, what they, he considers an adequate performance from their point of view is to present them with a copy of Fight Back as, uh, as they sit down and say, this is what we intend to do on the waterfront. Of course, it was of passing interest uh, his, uh, that he should have recommended that to the Prime Minister in Indonesia. 
Uh, whereas uh, if, I think if he had told the Indonesian president that he thought it was a really terrific idea to put the soldiers in against the Australian watersiders, he might well have triggered a memory when the, uh, when the Indonesians had some reason for, uh, for considerable gratitude and expressed it to members of the Australian waterfront. But the nub of the question is this, and it gets to the heart of what is microeconomic reform in this country, and that is you can take the process so far with changes in work practices on the waterfront or anywhere else in the transport industry. And then you come up to an irreducible minimum. Whereas if you are really going to lower costs, if you're really going to lower costs to people who wish to use those facilities for export, if you're really going to uh, achieve something for the Australian national economy, you run up against an archaic infrastructure. You can't get round that. Now, the fact of the matter is, with the forms that we have introduced on the waterfront, have more than exceeded the target set in October 92, when we expected that there would be one third off the waterfront. One th already there are 40 per cent, and the waterfront labour labor will be halved. And the productivity <laughs> gains have been even greater than we have, uh, uh, or that anyone indeed uh, had expected, and the costs accordingly are falling to those who, uh, to those who utilise the waterfront. The fact of the matter is, those reforms will be in place over the next 12 months, and those will be the reforms that are required as far as work practices are concerned on the waterfront. What you then run up against, what you then run up against is the fact that you cannot get competition between Australian ports is because our rail transport around the country, the infrastructure is archaic, and the road rail interface of the waterfronts is also archaic. And uh, so the One Nation statement went right to the heart of that. It went $30 million for the standard gauge rail link to Fisherman's Island to enhance the Port of Brisbane's ability to operate land bridging services and hence provide greater competition to southern ports on Pacific Basin routes. $20 million for the upgrading of Melbourne's Dynan Terminal to facilitate the standardisation of the Melbourne Adelaide Railway and allow for improvements to services to Sydney and Brisbane and also allow the Port of Melbourne to compete more effectively with other ports. Five million for a direct connection between Swanson and Appleton docks and Dine and Rail Terminal to reduce double handling of containers, reduce cargo handling time and allow the Port of Melbourne to compete more effectively with other ports. Eight million for the construction of a rail loop at the outer harbour in Adelaide. My friend, if you get into office, it will be closed with trenches not with strikes, <laughs> eight million for the construction of a rail loop at the outer harbour in Adelaide, which will form part of a hundred million dollar upgrading of the port. This will provide more competition between ports and involves an innovative approach to reducing delays and costs at the sea land interface. Thirteen million for improving the Fremantle Kalgoorlie line to enhance the Port of Fremantle's ability to operate land bridging services to the eastern states. And there are, and there, and there are, there are others that report in Townsville. Now, the fact of the matter is that anybody who knows anything about the essential elements of microeconomic reform in this country knows this that unless those infrastructure issues are addressed, all promises as far as microeconomic reform and what they might well deliver by the transport sector are irrelevant. Uh, non attainable. And everybody in the car industry knows this. Everybody in industries that are attempting to export know that. And they know that when they're presented with options on the, on the, of the, of the tariff proposals, for example, in the car industry that the opposition puts forward, when they say to them, oh, but you'll have all these other, uh, other benefits, they know it is baloney. They know it is nonsense. And that is why they are developing this hostility at the inability of the opposition to understand that they are not going to deliver what they talk about. Because what the opposition's position is on every one of these propositions I have put forward is to oppose them. And there will be a requirement again in the future to address further issues as far as the infrastructure of rail and ports is concerned. This is not going to be the end of the matter. There is nothing, there is absolutely nothing in Fight Back which addresses this in terms of en enhancing those capacities, all there is in fight back and in subsequent statements is a decision not to proceed with them and to criticise the government for doing so. That means that the microeconomic reform position of the opposition in the transport sector falls flat on its face. Flat on its face. The opposition will be able to deliver absolutely Order. nothing. The opposition will be able to deliver absolutely nothing 
in microeconomic reform to producers in this country, and, we're, and, and even though past loyalties, even though past loyalties, as far as uh, the uh, the opposition uh, is concerned, amongst the business community, would indicate order. There's far too much noise. The member for the minister will resume his seat. The member for Hume on a point of order. Mr. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, it's quite clear. Order, the member for Hume. Order. Mr Speaker, it's, it's quite clear that the Prime Minister has asked the Leader of the House to talk out question time. This is a great abuse of question time, and I ask that you require him to draw his order. answer to a close. Order, 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 Prime Minister. On a point of order, order. Mr order. Speaker, on a point order. of order, Mr the Speaker, on a point of order. I warned the member for Gippsland. Mr. Speaker, on the point of order, I did no such thing. I required, I, I did not require the leader to to uh, to, to uh, lengthen his reply. Order. Uh, I, I was quite prepared. Order. I was quite prepared to take other questions. I will now not take them. Ask further questions. Order. 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 The house will come to order. The member for Forest will cease interjecting. The House will come to order. The, the, mem the Leader of the, the House will come to order. Order! Order! If the member for Gippsland interjects again, I'll name him. Is the Leader of the National Party on a point of order? First, I have a point of order. The Leader of the if National Party. If he's going Party. to get as technical as that, he has not, in fact, required the end of question time in a time honoured fashion. I therefore put a question to him. I asked the Prime Minister. Order. The, the, question the Prime order. Minister. Order. Walk out. He's, he is required to ask. He is order. required to ask that the further questions be placed on order. notice. At no stage did he ask that further questions be placed on notice. Question time is still proceeding. Order. I have a question for the Prime Minister. Order. Order. My question to the Leader of the House. The Leader of the National Party might resume his seat. The Leader of the National Party might. Members on my right and my left. Order. Order. If the member for Bass interjects again, I'll name him. The House will come to order. The, the Prime Minister indicated that he didn't intend to accept any further questions. Order. 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 And the Prime Minister has left the chamber, so I doubt. So I doubt. I, 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 so I doubt. I doubt. With, I doubt. Order. 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 So I doubt whether it's possible for the honourable member to ask him a question. The Leader of the House. Mr. Speaker, papers are table. Does this <laughs> Order, order. The Prime Minister has said that he did not intend to take any further questions and has left the chamber. And, and has left the chamber. The Leader of the House with uh, a point of order, the Leader of the National Party. Mr Speaker, I put a further point of order to you that under standing orders and under parliamentary practice, it has been the specific custom, convention and procedure of this House but the Prime Minister asks that further questions be placed on notice. At no stage, at no stage, he took his bat home. He took his bat home. Order. He's not Order. game enough to face the music, but at no stage did he put those words. Order. In those circumstances, we are entitled to ask what the exact uh, ruling is. And if the question time is still open, I will ask my question to the Deputy Prime Minister. Order. 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 As I, as I, might, I might rule on the point of order wrote to the Minister of Order. Members on both sides will come to order. The Prime Minister indicated that he did not intend to take any further questions and the Prime Minister left the chamber. That, uh, as far as I'm sure anyone could understand, puts the end to question time today. The Mr. Speaker. The House. Mr. Speaker. Or, order. Mr. Speaker. I've called the Leader of the House. Uh, papers are tabled as listed Press on the view, schedule circulated to honourable members Mr. earlier today. I will ask a question, Mr. The Speaker. Speaker. Right honourable member for New England, resume his seat. The honourable leader of the House. Details of the papers Mr. will Speaker, be recorded. I will recorded. ask a question of you, and I will stand to do so. Order. The leader, the member for New England, will resume his seat. The leader of the House has the call. 
I just can't. I, just can't. I repeat myself. Details of the papers will be recorded in Hansard and the votes and proceedings. The question of you. Order, order. 